Hello, everyone. Hopefully you're having a good day uh, wherever this may find you. Uh, welcome to a, uh, another ERISA event. Uh, ERISA is a professional organization that strives to uh, uh, provide uh, connections and educational resources and material to GIS professionals uh, wherever they're at in their career with uh, whatever they may be doing. Um, and so we're definitely excited about this uh, topic today on accessory dwelling units. Uh, if you are a ERISA member, uh, please check into uh, ERISA Connect. Uh, it's it's uh, part of our website that is for members only that provides a way to get connected and stay connected with different topical groups and regional chapters, as well as uh, ERISA overall, uh, including uh, the Next Generation 911 Task Force, uh, which organizes the LEAP Conference and uh, puts on events like this uh, panel discussion. So a couple upcoming programs we wanted to make folks aware of. Uh, we do have the, uh, the GIS Leadership Academy, a couple on the books in uh, Denver and Seattle uh, coming up and the brand new uh, um, first edition of the advanced GLA uh, uh, 11 months away in, in Chicago. We are ramping up for GIS Pro uh, next month in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and we're working on the program uh, for the Location, Enterprise Addressing, and Public Safety Virtual Conference. Uh, that's uh, February 27th to 29th. And we always have some sort of event uh, going on uh, about some sort of webinar or panel discussion. You may be interested in a uh, Next Generation 911 GIS Ask the Experts panel uh, that we're having uh, next week, a uh, 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 week from Friday. Uh, have uh, myself and some other folks uh, on there. And so if you have a question or you're not sure what the buzz is, uh, feel free to uh, to hop in and uh, ask those questions. Uh, also wanted to uh, give a shout out to the ERISA Book Club. Um, this is a group that virtually uh, uh, meets to discuss through ERISA Connect and, and at a monthly meeting, a different book that they uh, are all interested in talking about. And so I think this month it's the uh, third edition of How to Lie with Maps, uh, the, uh, the the classic um, everything GIS and data text. So a key thing about ERISA is that uh, it's made up of all sorts of folks, um, individuals, volunteers, chapters, work groups, task forces, committees. Uh, and it's really focused on sharing experience and sharing what our passions and our experiences are with others in the ERISA and GIS professional community uh, because we are what provide those resources and education to others, to our peers, because we're running into the same thing or someone else may have found a solution or, or an experience. And that's really where today's session comes out of. Uh, we were at, uh, at the LEAP 2023 in February this year. Uh, there was some presentation up going on and talking about addressing problems and challenges. And all of a sudden, the chat started, well, accessory dwelling units. Oh, we have this problem with this, and our community causes this problem. And, oh, it's a, it's a headache for addressing. And, and so it really showed us that there was a, a part of our community was passionate about accessory dwelling units. And so that really led us into uh, what we're doing today, which is to uh, tackle this head on with some of those folks that were part of that conversation and were saying, hey, yeah, this is something that, that, that folks need to know more about or we need to provide more resources about. So accessory dwelling units are, um, uh, the American Planning Association defines them as smaller independent residential dwelling units located on the same lot as a standalone or detached single family home. So single family residential detached easy, everything else a little bit more problematic. And that can take many different forms. It could be detached, it could be attached. Usually it, it's found in, um, in more infill development areas and people do it for a variety of reasons. You know, maybe it's to give grandma a place to live. Maybe it's for a, 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 another a, a short-term rental or long-term rental. Uh, but as these have come along and zoning codes have, have adapted to them and, and it becomes part of, of the local government process, there are challenges all over the place. You know, challenges to communities and neighborhoods, the, the processes, how do we represent them in GIS and, and how, do we, uh, how do we address them? 
And I wanted an example of this. And so I, uh, I thought of a town and went on VRBO and found a listing of something that looked like might be an accessory dwelling unit and uh, found where it was in Google Maps. And, and this is not the only challenge, but, you know, just kind of a sample to get our heads wrapped around this other challenge that it can provide. And so it looks like if we look on the map that one of these back buildings here uh, was a garage got turned into a VRBO rental as a accessory dwelling unit. The main structure is uh, uh, 1011. Uh, the one over here is 1015. And so it was assigned the number of 1013 that we can kind of see on there. And we can kind of see that there's a pathway uh, between the different structures, the different buildings to get back there. So how do we track all those? Um, boy, we're, we're, we're really lucky, we're really glad that it wasn't 1011 and 1013, because figuring out the number for that, you know, is one of those challenges. But if we just think about all the different formations, all the different ways in which these scenarios can pop up, I, I think it, it gives us a, a reason, gives us some understanding of, of why this is a, a popular topic, both at LEAP uh, and then for, uh, uh, for, for, for today's discussion. So uh, to help us out and explore this and the similarities and differences of accessory dwelling unit challenges uh, across and between different communities, uh, we have a, a panel of volunteers that work in local government or work supporting local government that have said, hey, yeah, we, we, we see some things with this. We see these going on in our community that have um, uh, decided to, uh, um, you know, uh, want to share that knowledge and expertise. Um, and so I forgot to introduce myself. I'm the moderator, Matt Gerke. I work with uh, uh, URISA's Next Generation 911 Task Force and support local governments in, in Virginia. I'll be guiding our, uh, our volunteer panelists uh, through, uh, through some, some of the questions and conversation that we have and uh, throwing in the questions that you put into the chat box as uh, as we go along through this and so uh by way of introduction i, I like to ask uh, each panelist in order uh, to introduce themselves and describe your community uh, generally and uh, the general challenges you're facing with accessory dwelling units michelle thank you matt my name is michelle steinberg i am the address coordinator for picking county uh, picking county is um in Colorado, and the, the county seat is Aspen. We're located in the Roaring Fork River Valley. Aspen has been a growing leisure destination both in the summer and the winter since the 1960s. The valley attracts large numbers of people from all over the world. Approximately one and a half million people visited Picking County in the last two years. The resident population of Picking County is just over 17,000 people. The biggest challenge we are facing with auxiliary dwelling units, also known as ADUs, um, is what we've already, already talked about a little bit here, is how to identify those and consistently account for them. The growing use of these properties as short-term rentals is adding pressure to the county infrastructure and changes the feel of our historical rural community. A lot of these structures are added after the main house is built. Sometimes they go unpermitted and undetected because we have recently implemented regulations around the use of short-term rentals, more awareness is being brought to the attention of the county staff. The way these units are addressed and tracked historically has not been consistent. Addressing has to meet the needs of divergent software systems. For instance, community development has, needs to match the parcel and the address, but the elections team needs to know if the building is residential or commercial. Public safety is concerned with a unique data point that enables efficient dispatch for emergency services. The approaching need for consistent data management for next generation 911 compliance has our staff conversing a lot, but waiting to make any decisions until a clear path on data management is made. Excellent, thanks, Michelle. Amanda? Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Taub. I am the GIS analyst for Douglas County, Washington. Uh, Douglas County is a rural county located in north central Washington state. Uh, our county is over 1,800 square miles with an approximate population of 44,000. We have five small towns and one medium-sized city in the county. Um, 
but a lot of the county is rural. So we are bordered by the Columbia River on the north, west, and south sides. Um, and Grant County is bordering us on the east. Um, so we have a, a wide uh, difference in elevation. Our lowest elevation is at 600 feet at the Columbia River, and the highest is at Badger Mountain at 4,000. The top three industries in the county are agriculture, retail, and government. Um, we have quite a number of issues with our ADUs. Um, just determining the location of them and the number um, that are on a tax parcel can be quite challenging. Um, we also had developers coming in and requesting addresses to build ADUs and residences before they have built the roads to the ADU and the residents. Um, and before their final plat has been recorded, we call these issues model homes and have had to develop a brand new um, policy and workflow around them because they got to be such an issue. Um, so, we also have um, issues with uh, ADUs being placed between residences when there are no other number building addresses available to give them a number. Um, and this next issue is a problem with a lot of our large um, agricultural um, businesses and orchards is that they bring in manufactured homes or tiny homes from outside of the county and they don't always get the necessary permits to do so um, or they will move the homes from one location in the county to another without telling us. Um, a large issue that has been developing within the last five years is uh, recreational addresses. RV sites, uh, small cabins and campgrounds. Um, and then of course, I'm certain this next one's gonna be familiar with a lot of folks of homeowners and residents creating their own addresses or naming their private driveways without involvement from the local jurisdictions. And you know, how are we supposed to find them in an emergency? Um, we also have a lot of legacy ADUs that the addresses are just incorrect and they're going to have to get changed. We call them our problem addresses. Um, and then this final one is we're getting a lot more apartment campuses, commercial building campuses. We've got Microsoft coming to Douglas County and boy was that one involved. Um, and then we've got commercial buildings with suite numbers. Um, so yeah, we've got wide variety that we have to deal with, so. Excellent, thanks Amanda. Nick? Thanks Matt, thanks to the rest of the panel as well. Uh, Nick DiPaolo, Director of Geospatial Solutions uh, for JMT, we're a consulting group. Uh, my experience with Next Gen 911 is, uh, or just addressing in general, is we support a bunch of different projects uh, for addressing, especially in Pennsylvania and Maryland, where there's a big push for moving towards Next Gen 911. And in our projects, we've actually reviewed, updated, or created over three quarter million uh, address points, uh, some of them being ADUs. Uh, we found that just some of the issues across some of these counties, uh, and PSAPs has been just uh, Proper attribution for the ADU numbering, the proper unit number. Uh, are, there, are there preferences from the U USPS that you want to adhere to? Uh, sometimes you might have CAD restrictions. Some CAD systems might not want to accept a certain format, a uh, string, string or numeric, and, that and they might actually have uh, character size limits in the fields for that, that unit number. Uh, and, and just also keeping the, um, we've seen some of the, keeping the ADUs uh, properly updated with fitting into the NINA model. Uh, that's also something we've seen quite a bit of. Uh, 
I also forgot to mention I'm, I'm also a volunteer firefighter on a couple of fire departments in New Jersey and on a land search and rescue team for Camden County, New Jersey. So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here is near and dear to my heart because it's just really challenging when you get pulled into a call and you don't exactly know where to go. Um, so um, that's a, just as an interesting uh, side note. Um, one anecdotal note is in, in a, we, I can share is in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's outside. It's in Montgomery County, about 30 minutes west of Philadelphia. They had these historic long uh, parcels that are in the downtown area, much longer than a normal parcel would be. And they started building ADUs in the back end of them. Um, and those back ends of these, these long units had an alleyway uh, that wasn't a real st true street. So how do you, how do you properly uh, address these ADUs? The simple uh, resolution might be just to turn that alleyway into an actual street so you could address because those ADUs were facing that alleyway. Uh, but the problem is that if you did that, then the town would be responsible for not only putting up street signs and actually labeling this thing properly, but then also they'd be responsible for snow removal. So there was a big push politically to not maybe go that direction because of the additional cost that they might have. So this actually has more than just maybe sometimes a numbering component. It has a real world uh, application. And so how do you deal with getting packages to uh, places like that? How do re emergency responders get to those um, ADUs? Uh, when it's not necessarily anywhere near the, uh, the the street that it's addressed on. It might be 250 feet back in that lot. So um, looking forward to kind of seeing what the rest of the discussion is for this uh, session. I'll hand it back to Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. And you, you brought back some reoccurring nightmares of naming public alleys in, uh, in a town I worked in. Uh, so that you could address off of them. It's uh, that, that might that might be a topic for another panel discussion. Uh, Rhonda, can you tell us about Tacoma? I certainly can. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, first off, my name is Rhonda Perozo. I'm the GIS analyst for South Sound 911, um, the 911 agency for all of Pierce County. Uh, our office is located in Tacoma, Washington. And um, just to give you a little background about our agency in 2011, uh, we actually took five different 911 uh, centers and we consolidated them to form South Sound 911. And now we're basically the, the whole entire county, uh, South Sound 911 is a 911 authority for that. Uh, we're recognized actually as being experts in um, police and fire interoperability because we brought everybody together into the same building. We answer approximately one, well, a little over actually 1 million emergency and non-emergency calls uh, yearly for 19 different law and 19 different fire agencies. And we do have um, a military installation as well as a national park and, you know, uh, Puget Sound and a whole bunch of other things in our, in our jurisdiction. So uh, for, for us, uh, and Nick kind of alluded to it, our biggest issues when it comes to challenges with ADUs, it really does rely around the fact that um, they can be very inconsistently addressed and the access is, th those are the top two concerns um, for emergency services. Um, when it comes to inconsistent addressing, uh, you know, they could, ADUs can get their own address. Some jurisdictions do that. Some jurisdictions will give them units and they might give the main house a unit when they build an ADU and give the ADU a unit. They might call it um, back or rear or upper or lower or <laughs> half even. And so all these different ways that the ADUs can actually be addressed does create some confusion uh, for uh, especially our call takers and dispatchers when they're just trying to get the where are you question asked. Uh, and then access, of course, uh, you know, one of our fire chiefs that I was consulting with, uh, he says his biggest concern is always when they're dispatched to the to where they're addressed off of, as Nick alluded to again, but the actual access is behind off the alley. So that causes delay in um, emergency um, care being provided to that citizen. And I'll hand it back over to you, Matt. Thanks, Rhonda. And last but certainly not least, Heather. Hello, my name is Heather Studley. I am the GIS manager for Bannock County, um, which is a small county in Southeast Idaho. County seat is a little town called Pocatello, little-ish. Um, 
a lot of our issues are the same that everybody else has already gone over. None of this is, is new or exciting. Um, where some of our unique situations come into play is we are officially designated as a rural county. And as such, it's about half of the land in our county is designated as agricultural, which severely limits what kind of building officially you can do. As everybody else has already mentioned, people are very, very good about just doing things on their own. Um, we also have a couple of unique situations. We have a lot of BLM and Forest Service land. Uh, probably about a third of our county total is Forest Service or BLM. Um, a lot of people will end up with little spots of land completely surrounded by some kind of public land, which creates access concerns um, all the way around, as well as fire hazard and those other kind of fun things to deal with. Um, straight up for addressing for us, um, some of the challenges we have is actually ordinance based and the differences between county and cities. We have two relatively large cities. Pocatello is the county seat, the largest at about 50,000, has a neighboring community called Chubbuck, which is approximately another 20,000. So most people live in one giant area and then we've got little cities scattered all over the place and everybody's got different rules and different procedures that they go through. So for the county, we specifically say you could have one address per parcel, period. If you do an accessory structure, um, affectionately referred to as mother-in-law suites, um, it must be within 100 feet of the existing building and it must share the same address. That's by ordinance. So does that mean that we can do A, B designations? We're not sure. We're working through that process right now. Um, we also specifically have in county ordinance that if you do a secondary building, it cannot be used as uh, rental. I think we're a little bit unusual that we actually went to that specification, but there is still some vocabulary that needs to be cleared up for that one. Um, part of this confusion also comes from the fact that when we come to our assessor's office, they only ever track one address on a property. So if you have in the cities where you have multiple units per property, because the cities allow that, they'll only list the primary address. I live on one of those properties. My address wasn't officially listed anywhere for years because nobody had it because I was a secondary. Um, going back to the alleyway thing, we only have one city that tries to officially address off of alleyways. Um, and that's kind of an interesting prospect on its own right, but we do have a lot of back alley access. Same kind of a thing um, that Nick was talking about, long properties. And a lot of people on the alleyway will stick a little, it was, probably was a garage at one point in time that has been modified to become an apartment. We get a lot of halves. So one, two, three, main and a half kind of a thing, which is another problem because our 911 CAD system does not allow special characters. <laughs> and Nick's shaking his head on that one, yes. Um, so that's part, and as the county is the 911 aggregator, I'm the one who has to deal with the cities going, we allow this, and I'm going, great, our 911 system doesn't, now what do we do? So nothing unusual per se, but because we've got such a spread out community, things get very, very, heated. And I've already seen one comment pop up in chat saying that um, people get very possessive about their addresses. So when you do have situations where you do have to go through and look at readdressing, in our case, it's a lot of times it's in the recreational communities, just trying to get a hold of people because mm -hmm. they don't live in our state. They live somewhere else and just trying to get a hold of them going, are you guys even okay with that? And all of a sudden three years later, they're going, you guys changed my address. We're like, yeah, you never said anything. So that becomes its own special communication process on its own right. I'll turn it back over to you, Matt. All right, thanks, Heather. And uh, you know, the, the great thing about panel discussions is that um, bringing together so many different perspectives and experiences on something that we all have in common. You know, we all have addressing, we all have local rules and ordinances or, or policies, and we're all, you know, we're all experiencing these same challenges in different ways. And so I, I, I really like the uh, um, the diversity of panelists and, and that, you know, hopefully any any member of the audience can go, OK, well, yeah, th that one isn't necessarily like me. But, yeah, that problem that they spoke to, yeah, that definitely really applies to me. 
and uh, really seeing some of that in the chat. If if you don't have the chat open, there there's uh, all sorts of uh, information finding and seeking that's uh, that's going on there, and a, a couple questions that we'll come back to. So I, I guess stepping back, um, one of the, the the things that several of you mentioned was that you know, and in some cases, ADU should follow a a permit process or a building process or a zoning process, depending on the local rules and and, and regulations. Um, and one of the big problems is that sometimes not all of them do, right? But I'm I'm kind of wondering, um, and, and does your community handle ADUs through that process differently than they would a single family residential detached structure? That 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 typical structure. And, and, and so what, what I'm trying to think about are is, you know, do, do, do your local codes, you know, recognize that this is a different, unique problem that maybe we can't handle the same way in, in terms of uh, addressing and permitting the same way that we do for, do would for a regular house. So I'll turn that open to the panel if anybody wants to, uh, to, to jump in and, and share some thoughts on that. I've kind of touched on it already, so I'll just expand a little bit on that one. Um, specifically, when people are trying to do detached accessory dwellings, if it's attached to the main structure, um, that's a completely separate process for us. But specifically for the detached ones, they do have the rules in place. It has to be, like I said, within 100 feet of the main structure property allows. We get some elevation things. That becomes a different issue. Um, and it must share the same address as our existing one. But like I said, we've already run into places where this doesn't work per se because the 911 systems don't know how to deal with that. So are we going to the primary address or the secondary one? We also run into the problem where people build an accessory dwelling. They don't tell us it's an accessory dwelling. They permit it as something else. We said we are huge agricultural community ag people will often permit for ag structures and then just throw an apartment at the top of the barn without saying anything and it's not till we do inspections that we realize that no there's actually set up for somebody to live there which becomes not only a permitting issue and a safety issue but a 911 issue as well one other one we get that isn't a dwelling thing per se but is a detached structure is large agricultural lands, you have your main chunk, your housing unit kind of things, but all your barns are on the opposite end of a 160 acre chunk of property with a completely different access. If those barns catch on fire, now what do we do? So not a dwelling thing per se, but still a 911 consideration. And that's part of the challenges that we're looking at, so. Yeah, Heather, I, I, I feel you. I also have lots and lots of agricultural lands with lots of agricultural buildings. Um, and yet we've started giving them addresses too. Um, and actually that's coming from the state um, for, usually it's a state permit thing that they, that the, those owners need that. So um, our workflow is very, very similar when we assign an address to an ADU as it is to assigning to a, a main residence. Um, so we we do have a permitting software and uh, addressing is part of the workflow of a permit for a building. So we get to review all of those. Um, sometimes, sometimes, rarely, there is actually still an address um, that has not been used, but has been assigned to a property. So then we can shift that off to the ADU or the house as is um, something that we can we can do um we have our the county has an addressing code um and it is on um our website um i'm working on a standards document um it's in draft form right now so um and then just our workflow 
has been refined. We've been, we've been assigning addresses for almost 20 years. And so we've just been refining it as time goes on. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's the model homes, which just became a huge issue for us. Um, and then of course, all the farm worker housing um, is also a huge issue um, because we are a rural agricultural county. Um, and so, yeah, that's it for us. Piggyback off of uh, Heather's comments and, and put a little bit of a different spin on it as well. <clears throat> so uh, we talked about that uh, that bar, that farm or the agricultural property where that barn might be on a different part of the parcel. Uh, it's important that you have, and there's been a lot of great comments in this thread, by the way, about uh, communications uh, between the planning, GIS and public safety because of scenarios like this, especially in rural areas. You need to talk about possibly access points. And I think um, Heather mentioned that because to get to that specific uh, structure, that actually might be a different um, response area, uh, emergency service zone. It, it might be easier for a different fire department to get to that that property, even though the address for the property is where the main dwelling is, maybe a mile away, depending on the size of the property. So the more a closer local fire department can get there. And also you have to think about, again, this is my, my public safety side of things, but host stretches. If you have um, a parcel, a structure that's pretty far back in a lot, uh, you might have to get a, your fire department wants to know that they got to stretch a hose 600 feet to get to that. So someone mentioned, I think it was Amanda talked about putting out that fire. Uh, you might not have enough hose on that truck to get to that if you don't know all those details. So it's really important that you communicate and think about these things from the perspective of the GIS, public safety and planning so that they're all in the loop as you start to plan this out, because you might actually have to adjust uh, your PSAP boundaries or your emergency services zones based off of things like this that really are nitty gritty, but they really could save lives in the long run. And I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit off um, all of that as well, uh, just to kind of point out a unique situation for a GIS analyst with a 911 agency where we are not the addressing authority. We are just taking every um, different jurisdictions addressing, uh, bringing it in so that we can use it. Uh, so the important part for us is that we actually do want to make sure we're having really good communication with all those folks that do addressing, um, try to express all our concerns about how they're being addressed, yet at the same time respect um, whatever their ordinances are, but we do want to know where everybody's at. Um, kind of like Nick and everybody else has stated, we want to put, we want a point that we can <laughs> point to to say this is where the emergency is at. And then that'll help um, obviously get the emergency services to that person as quickly as possible. All right. I was gonna say in Picking County, um, we have a we have a standard that was put in place in uh, 2016 that we use for county addressing. Um, we do have the the challenge, the cooperation uh, that we have. Uh, we're, we, we're responsible for the unincorporated parts of the county. Um, and then there's the municipalities that may or may not follow the same policies and procedures that we uh, have in place. So that can be a challenge, um, particularly because the municipalities like Aspen or Snowmass, um, they are the places where a lot of uh, units um, like uh, condos and apartments Things like that are addressed, and they're they're not always consistent. Um, the accessory dwelling units probably are more in the rural area where we address, and we we for the most part treat those just like any other addressable structure. If it's addressable, then we use the standards to address it. Um, we do put a B unit on an attached ADU, but if it's a separate detached unit, it gets its own address. Um, and then we also use the access way and the sentry system to determine the actual address. So they might be on the same parcel, but if one has its own driveway, it might actually be addressed off of a different named road, depending on where the access way is. Um, so yeah, just to add to that. Excellent, thank you. So um, Nick, Nick brought up some of the implications for 911 in response to next generation 911 that you know kind of come up with how we how we address or how an accessory dwelling unit may be addressed and uh cynthia had uh, had a question come in that i think heather you wanted to speak to 
Um, the questions about how is everyone translating their GIS data for ADUs to meet the next generation 911 GIS data model and the CLDXF schema, uh, which tends to be more of a, a flat model, uh, especially when you're dealing with units and sub addresses and, and, and those can be stacked or relational depending on our different local government things. Heather? The reason I tagged that one is because I think I feel like we're almost unusual on how I've decided to approach this, which is we literally just build it all into the GIS system. Um, I'm not trying to do, I've had so many issues in the past dealing with relational tables with joins and everything else, even just getting something from a standard data set of ours onto RGS online and the relations break and the joins don't work. And I basically just shove it all together. And that means, yeah, the data sets can be kind of large. I've got a field because 911 wants full names. They want street typed out, road typed out, et cetera. Our CAD system needs a STRD. Okay, so I've got a, you know, a type and then I've got an abbreviation. And just, I just join, not even join, but just, they're just all in there. A lot of them can be auto calculated. We only fill out the main parts and then we just run the field calculates to, to fill in the rest of it. But especially when it comes to dealing with these multiple systems, I personally found that's the easiest way to do it. Um, it's a bit more work and it's a lot more planning on your GIS people to get all that stuff in there. But I think this is one of those cases where you put in the work at the beginning to make it easier on the end. So that was kind of, I, I seem to be unusual on how I approach that. I've had a lot of people tell me that that's not the best way to do it, but that's what we've had to do to get it to all work together. No, Heather, I, I do the same. I, I, and I've had, I've, I agree with you. I've, I've had people tell me that that's not the, the proper way to do it, but um, I, I've, I agree with you. I've had so many problems trying to do joins and relates and all of that, that it's just easier to put the sub addresses with the regular addresses all in one layer and just manage it that way. Um, because otherwise I, I don't want them getting lost. And, and that's my fear is if I don't do it this way, they will get lost. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak up on that as well. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty common to manage it that way. And, and so I, you know, all in one layer in, in GIS or having things where you can filter it out. Um, and it may depend on what system is your version of the truth. Um, because I think increasingly GIS addresses are the version of the truth. You know, it certainly is for next generation 911. And so we need to format those in a way to load them up there to meet those requirements for that system. But if you have other business systems that need to meet, need, need those addresses, it may have different business rules that you may need to do some different things for. Uh, and so I, I, I think that's really, you know, the, the, the answer is how do you meet the requirements? And there, uh, uh, there's a great, um, I won't say great, there, there is a ERISA webinar recording on developing an ETL process and an ETL strategy uh, from a couple of years ago that's up on the website. That's uh, worth checking out if you want to think through uh, some of those issues. So I, I know that we've, we've kind of talked about through the course of our conversation how ADUs cause addressing challenges. Um, I want to spin this question around. Um, what are the best practices that you think folks should follow to prevent accessory dwelling units from being addressing problems in the future? If we're not doing it right, how do we do it right? Or how can we do it better? Matt, one thing I think, and you're seeing this in the chat, is that <clears throat> it requires a lot of coordination, I think, and you're seeing some folks here that are adopting best practices at the county level or the PSAP level. And it really, you know, Nina's great for the, the data model for next and I'm on one. It creates that baseline, but all these different PSAPs are using different CAD systems and they have different uh, local um situations or, or just uh, scenarios really uh, for addressing in, in ADU types. 
Uh, you know, the, same, the situations you'll see in the Philadelphia area are, are different than what maybe uh, Amanda is seeing. Uh, so uh, it's important that they locally kind of adopt best practices and getting the buy-in from folks outside of just the technical folks. You need a champion who might be a, a commissioner or whatever, however your government is organized or someone that's the, the head of the public safety uh, department that can really champion this because a lot of times you need you need to coordinate with the municipalities within the county or the PSAPs especially in like Pennsylvania um, areas where, where the addressing authority is local in that Commonwealth, the, the actual municipalities have the addressing authority, but the county is responsible for maintaining the 911 system. So imagine that, that coordination there where the county has to, is responsible for the dispatch, but they have no control over the addresses technically. So you got to have that coordination. And I think that you've seen probably six or seven examples in the chat where people have posted best practices. And I'd say that that's one area where you can really kind of at a policy level kind of formulate a plan so that everybody's on the same page. We got to repeat that part about the buy-in. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. I was just thinking, I, I agree with what Nick was saying about the commu the communication and the coordination um, at, as the address coordinator. Um, we have to constantly re-advocate even our internal audiences um, for the purpose of addressing and who it benefits. And, um, and uh, it's important to know that we have those uh, standards in front of us that we can present to people when we have questions because um, it is sometimes hard um, to change addresses which we won't get into that subject too much but in a rural county like uh, Peking County we've also had some address historical addresses that have um, we've had to accept and try to figure out how to deal with and sometimes we have to change things and the um, it's always a hard con conversation to have with the public, um, but it's ultimately not their address, right? Um, but we do have, uh, we started an advocacy group or an, uh, an advisory group of internal people. And then I also communicated with other address coordinators and people who have an vested interest in GIS and, and get their input and their support um, when we have questions. And that's really helpful to get kind of a national perspective on that. And then that internal group um, helps us when we do have to um, make some changes or become aware of things, they can um, be on the ground to help with changes. Um, so yeah, sure, I could talk about this a lot, but I, I don't wanna take too much. Um, yeah, I mean, we do, we do a lot. Um, I am constantly in contact with Rivercom, which is our local 911 dispatch. Um, they dispatch to Douglas County and Chelan County and all of the cities in both counties. Um, and so I'm constantly sharing questions, constantly sharing, um, here's the new address that we just assigned, uh, making certain that I am sending a map, trying to get the cities and the towns to do the same to me. Oh my gosh. Um, especially when we have so much turnover in the small cities and towns, um, or even in East Wenatchee, which is our major town. Um, not the town seat, but our major town. And, you know, just getting them to talk to us um, because they don't actually assign many addresses all that often, um, except when they do. Uh, and so, yeah, getting to work with the cities, the post office, um, you know, for, for 20 years, I've been developing relationships with the local postmasters, um, which by the way, is also interesting because they change so often. Um, so yeah, that one was definitely just, just, working with other departments to try and get the communication open, 
working with other cities, working with um, post office, and um, it it's a constant, constant thing. Um, yeah. I'll add just a little bit to that. Um, I've actually noticed, you know, us not being an addressing authority. I, I agree 110% with what Amanda's saying. The communication with all those different authorities is so important. I have found that the the movement that we're all going through right now of moving to Next Gen 911, where GIS is the driver of all 911 <laughs> data coming in to for emergency response, it's really helped actually get many of our different addressing authorities to communicate better and, and you know work with us more, get the data in the format that we need, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so I know that I, I pretty much reach out to all our different authorities, especially if I knew, know somebody new came on and I'm just like, hey, just make sure we're included on all those addressing emails that you send out. Whether you think we need it or not, I can always delete it if I don't need it, but uh, it's, it's better to have the more information, so. And I think just the last two cents on that one is that, you know, the communication aspect, getting everybody to talk to each other, because and we're the same, uh, Count Nick was talking about, every city has their own, they are their own authority, and the small ones in particular are terrible about letting us know when they add addresses. Um, and then we've got um, an extra addition for us for addressing is we also share about the top quarter of our county with um, a Native American reservation, who is also their own authority and their own dispatch. But there's a lot of overlap, but a lot of people don't know where the boundary line is. So they'll just call in with an address and say, you know, we need help. And they, it's hard to tell sometimes if they're on that reservation line or not. So that's another one we get to deal with and getting that communication channel open has been remarkable on what it's done for our dispatch efforts. So I wish the cities were as willing to talk to us as they were. <laughs> All right, uh, great, great discussion, great insights, um, even with the curveballs that your moderator is, is, uh, is throwing at you. Uh, really appreciate the uh, all the information that we're sharing in conversation and sharing in chat. Um, so, so we've touched on this a little bit um, in that you know there there are problems or challenges with this accessory dwelling units for addressing and public safety. Starting to see some things come up in the chat about you know uh, uh, assigning things that have electric meters, or there there was one about well we'd permit it like we would for you know a, a gazebo or or a porch. Uh, and we're starting to see some things uh, uh, coming up about, well, you know, our, our assessor only allows one address for the parcel, and, and what do we do with this? And, and, and so I, I think this really all feeds into the, the final question. You know, what other challenges for GIS-related workflows do accessory dwelling units pose? Um, and if you have these challenges, how are you updating those workflows or changing what you do? Uh, to, to try to make it work a little bit easier for you. Oddly for us, part of what we ended up doing to make things easier, and I use the term loosely, uh, specifically, I'm going to tag the, like the power usage. We do, um, our building department will specifically do things called power waivers. It's usually for things like RV pads campsites, things like that, where people want to be able to plug their RV in, and there's no other structure there. Maybe a cement pad, but usually it's just a post with power. And we we started taking over the addressing for that because the power company was just assigning address for those. If, they, if we didn't have one readily available, they would just assign one um, to the point where we actually, as a county, had to issue a cease and desist order to one of our power companies to tell them to stop doing that. Um, so that's that was, that was interesting. And those are, one of the other ones we get off of this one is 
um, which Nick has pointed out too, is, is access. So we base our addressing numbers based off of where your driveway meets the main road, not where the structure is. The point goes where the structure is, but we have to do our numbering off of access points because you get some long, windy driveways sometimes, which is another access issue. So that's kind of been an interesting one to deal with. And the one that I've been seeing in chat that everybody's got and we all hate it is road names. When you have similar or heavens help you same road names in the municipality or neighboring municipality where you've got same dispatch. The only thing you can do is communication. You've got to talk to people and get everybody on the same because we certainly have it. Every single town has a main street and a center street every single one of them on um, very similar is you will end up with 53 main street with six different <laughs> or actually up to eight in our case, eight different zip codes, potentially it's just, and the only way you can keep track of those is to keep everybody talking and make sure everybody's on the same page. If there's nothing else that comes out of this, you need to find out who your stakeholders are and get everybody involved and then keep them involved. May the odds be in your favor doing that but I can't stress enough how much those communication lines make a difference. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got Rivercom who is my dispatch. Um, but to the North of us, we've got Okanagan County. Um, and then to the East we have Grant County and Okanagan County. We don't generally talk to all that often, but, Grant County, we do, um, just because we're starting to get more development over on the east side of the county. And um, <laughs> the issue that we're having now is that people are having to use Douglas County roads to access an address in Grant County. And oh my, that just adds so much complexity. And um, the the Grant County Authority, uh, he's, he's kind of new. So he's still trying to fill things out, feel things out over on his side. But we're, yeah, we've got a potential one right now that we're going to work with. challenges uh, with the just related workflows. I think it's important. <clears throat> I've seen this in the thread quite a bit where folks are, uh, you know, there's issues because that maybe the assessor office has only, only wants one address for the parcel and it's challenging for them. Uh, I think there's an education that has to come from the GIS folks to these other departments that a parcel layer is not the same as an address point layer. They serve different purposes. And where you might have certain rules on the parcel area because of you know how your tax system is handled and the assessors um, handle things. On the addressing side, you have other requirements and needs, and it's okay to have multiple locations or points on a single parcel and how you number them and all. And you might have an overall primary address, but there might be some differences in the unit numbering and all. There's an education because there's a lot of folks that are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole here. In different, I've seen it in my own counties that I've worked on in, in Eastern PA where they, they try to accept that and then they just add additional fields onto their address point layer that really aren't really what you would concern an address um, for 911 purposes at least. So I think there needs to be that education that happens and it's going to take some time because everybody is so used to just using the parcel layer for everything in a lot of ways. Uh, that's 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 a great point. You know, it's it's all of our technology problems are people problems and it's about that, that people in those relationships, you know, but it's also understanding that all those people have different needs and, uh, and, and how do we, you know, get folks to understand that what we ask of our GIS um, keeps growing in, in all sorts of uh, different ways. So we do have a minute or two. If, if there, uh, there are any questions that come in, in the chat, uh, but as we work towards uh, uh, wrapping that up, um, I wanted to thank you, 
Michelle, Amanda, Nick, Rhonda, and, and Heather for uh, for taking the time to put some thoughts together and uh, uh, be on camera, uh, speaking your experiences, uh, but also the audience. We, we had uh, so many folks uh, uh, sign up for this uh, uh, for this webinar. Um, I think it's one of the top ones that, that especially over the last three years. And, and so we know it's um, uh, uh, people connect with what they're passionate about. And sometimes that's the good solution. Sometimes that's the problem. Sometimes that's wanting to make the world a better place in the, uh, in the different ways um, that we do it or that we can do it. Uh, and so it, it does take all of us sometimes to share our experiences, share our ideas, uh, to uh, to work with that. Um, okay, there is a quick question that came in um, over in the Q and A. Um, so it, it's really getting at limitations of software, and if a dispatch system or assessor system. You know, has certain requirements. I, I know that that some ERP systems that base off of addresses are really restrictive in terms of what you can put in for an address or a unit or a designation. Um, you know, are 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 there? Do you have any recommendations for strategies to overcome that or work around that? You know, other than you know some of what we talked about before with. Um, you know, coming up with with processes to move your one version of the truth make it look different for different systems that have different needs. Um, I think having an open discussion with your vendor um, to say, these are the problems and I need you to help me fix this. Um, especially with that hexagon um, issue. Um our dispatch uses Spillman, and I know that the first 10, 15 years of doing so, they had so many issues, and they still have some issues. Um, so it, you know, it's definitely getting onto your vendor, making certain that your vendor hears you, and connecting with other users of that vendor and if if there's multiples of you saying this is a problem then your vendor is more likely to listen to you and put it into their workflow to try to solve um you know, I, we've seen that with Esri. We've seen that with with multiple other software providers. Um, you have to be vocal. You have to be um, continually saying this is a problem and it needs to get fixed. Um, I I had a, a similar problem with our um, assessing uh, software. Um, the way that they would have us add multiple addresses literally took me 10 minutes for one address. Um, when they finally allowed us the ability to add more than one address to a parcel. And I went, that's not workable. And I actually wrote down my workflow as to how I was adding this and invited them to tell me I'm wrong. Um, and they changed it. So now it it takes a minute or two rather than 10 or more. So, you know, being vocal, um, being adamant, finding other people with the same problem. So, all right, it's, it's, it, there's solutions, but it's people. And, uh, you know, the comment there, support group, a great way to to find that support group is to tune in. You know, Eurissa on social media and connect. Uh, there are regional chapters. There are other organizations. Uh, there are things like Leap, and and this this session today um, came out of Leap, uh, and and so great opportunities to get involved if you want a uh, 
a, a regular check-in. Uh, the ERISA Next Generation 911 Task Force deals with all things related to Next Gen, including addresses and the uh, and the GIS for it. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe, maybe we need to start a uh, a group on ERISA for the addressing group therapy session, um, or maybe just more webinars and panel discussions to uh, share experiences and let people chime in on chat. So this web this uh, webinar is recorded. Uh, we will get that up on the ERISA website through the YouTube channel. Uh, we will save the chat. I will probably only send the chat out to the participants who had attended the webinar. Um, there, there's uh, some great stuff in there, but I feel like it would be more most useful from those of us that that were here participating in the conversation. So, uh, so thank you again, everybody. And if you have ideas of uh, specific topics uh, or or other content that you think would be valuable or you'd like to contribute for it to, in terms of addressing and GIS, uh, please reach out to uh, uh, your your folks at ERISA, your friends. Uh, and uh, let's help us get more con content organized so we can connect with each other and learn and uh, uh, carry on. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.